going back to the idea you're having a biological experience, I, I want to scream that at people so that they understand, okay, you're having a problem. You're going to blame yourself. You're going to say you're a loser. Stop. Remember that this is a biology problem. Solve for the biology. You're missing something. Amen. It, if you are, look, some of this is psychological. There is no doubt, but the psychology is built on top of the biology. And if you, I mean, look, it, it, it is a feedback loop. There is no doubt. But if you're yes. going to give me one lever to pull, I'm going to pull the biology lever first and foremost, most aggressively, because if you have all the desire in the world, but you cannot create the ATP, you're not going to be able to do the things you want to do. Like when people ask me how I have so much energy, how I can work so hard, all that, I'm like, well, first of all, at a cellular level, I can generate the energy to do the things that I want to do. So true. And I'm so focused on my energy levels, my biology. I eat based on my goals. I sleep based on my goals. Like I do all the things that I need to do to optimize my biology because I'm trying to do these things and goals make demands. Right. So if you're trying to be the best parent, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, if you're whatever, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. You are going to have to be able to be hyper persistent. You're going to have to be completely determined. There's a great quote, forget he's a super famous coach, but he said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Mm. I always thought, ooh, that's something. To think that I have a completely different personality when I'm fatigued. Oh, no doubt. That's one of those. And you're like, also in a low oxidative state, yeah. I think that I, I have never thought about it in terms of oxygen because I don't know the process well enough. But that makes a lot of sense to me that mm -hmm. um, whatever thing we're describing, if we're using a sort of blunt tool like the word fatigue, or we're really down into the weeds and it the answer is oxygen and the mm -hmm. rate at which it's traveling through your system, it's the same idea. Your physiology is stopping you at some level from doing the thing you wanna do. And that, and this was an idea introduced to me by Jordan Peterson, where he said, uh, we have micro personalities. Mm. And he's like, when you're in a certain mood, and he always used the example of an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You have an alcoholic, they're a different version of themselves, entirely different um, set of morality, uh, the way they act, whether they're aggressive, whether they're willing to lie, like all these things. Like they slot into a very knowable set of personality traits when they're um, after their next drink. And right. when I thought, ooh, that's really interesting. so. I have a different micro personality when I'm feeling really anxious that I don't respect in myself. That, that doesn't mean I don't respect other people dealing with it. I'm just saying one of the things that I do to pull myself out of that is I just do not allow myself to stay there. Now, of course, I need to address the biology as well, but it's like, that's the feedback loop. You have yeah. to get the, the biology right, but you also have to get the mindset right because they are gonna feed back to each other yeah. in this never But the mindset loop. is born from the biology. You know, we talked earlier about what is in a mood, what is an emotional state, it's this collection of neurotransmitters, manufacturing those neurotransmitters, creating the supply. Um, and then once you create the supply, learning to regulate it is a part of what creates all these little anchors that are off of our stern, right? And we talked about anxiety, but you know, so many of these, especially in the entrepreneurial community, we, they, you know, they quote unquote suffer from ADD or ADHD, but we don't really realize that attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hy hyperactivity disorder, these are not really attention deficits at all. They're actually attention overload disorders, right? There are too many windows open at the same time. You know, people that have ADD or ADHD don't lack the ability to pay attention. They lack the ability to pay attention to so many things, right? So, so for example, you know, in the human mind, we know well that we don't just create thought, right? We also dismantle thought. We actually downregulate thought, mm. or else you'd always be in the same mood. You'd always think the same thing. How do we transfer from mood to mood? You experience a mood, you have a stimulus, it creates a certain cascade of neurotransmitters, then those neurotransmitters are degraded and you no longer <clears throat> feel that mood. You no longer feel that emotional state. So if that process is too fast or too slow, then you can hold on to things for a prolonged period of time. You know, like my wife and I have different methylation, and we do, you know, we, we hold on to things very differently. If we have friction in the morning, by the time I walk out of the bedroom, I've totally forgotten we even had an argument. Like I'll walk back in the bedroom and be like, babe, you want some coffee? And she's like, are you seriously talking to me right now? I'm like, yeah. She's like, we just had a massive fight. And I'm like, that was like 10 minutes ago, right? Are we still fighting? Cause she's like, well, you didn't apologize to me. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. 
Um, you know, I mean, it's, I, it, they just leave my body like instantly. Um, but you know, she can hold on to those. So what is the difference between these things? It's the rate at which we break these, these things down. People with attention deficit disorder, which is so prevalent, have, you know, they have a slow breakdown of these neurotransmitters that, that allows thought to continue to pile on top of thought, on top of thought, on top of thought. And that's why the mind gets the mind gets clouded. It's not that they can't pay attention. It's that they can't pay attention to so many things, right? And usually this is also nutrient deficiencies, which is why diet can actually make ADHD or an ADD much worse, or it can actually make it much better. Methylfolate, for example, the primary nutrient that actually helps downregulate neurotransmitters, when that's deficient, people will go from thought to thought to thought. And so they'll They'll be thinking about a job they're working on and, and, and their friend walks up and they are thinking about a job, they start talking to their friend and then they notice the logo on their friend's jacket that reminds them of a vacation that they want to take. And now they're thinking about a job, talking to their friend, looking at a logo, thinking about a vacation they want to take all at the same time because they haven't degraded those, those previous thoughts. I mean, I think that when you're talking about the foundation being like sunlight, sleep, um, you know, uh, blood sugar control. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, but the other that I would add to that is seriously is diet and or targeted supplementation. Those I'm going to add things. something weird to the conversation here. The thing that I will add is I think that there is, there's not enough consequence in people's lives. Like when you are in a modern context, there's so many safety nets, things are, you can be in an air conditioned room, you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from, certainly for the vast majority of people in the West. Mm -hmm. And anecdotally, from just my own experience as somebody who was diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder when I was a kid, they would almost certainly call it ADHD now. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it feels is, um, I'm doing this thing, I hit a moment of discomfort and my brain goes, oh, cool. Here's another thing to think about that isn't as uncomfortable as that thing. And then mm. when that one gets comfortable, here's another thing to think about that. And so I'm constantly having to force myself to come back to the task. When, however, the stakes are high, and this is why I think a lot of people say I work best under pressure, is you need the sense of like, holy shit, the world is going to end or something very bad is going to happen if I don't do this. And so you're just waiting for that moment where it clicks over and now the stakes suddenly feel high enough and you have to address it. Mm -hmm. And so I call this, some people need to be chased by a lion. And when you're being chased by a lion, that's real clarifying. That is the only thing you're going to be thinking about and dealing with at that moment. I, I agree with that too. But I mean, this that if if your whole life depends on you being chased by a lion, I mean, the amount of stress that you put your, yourself under is, you know, in, in a lot of cases, is highly unnecessary. What if you actually, instead of giving equal priority to all of the tasks that come into your mind, which is what happens when you open thought at a faster rate than you degrade it, you start to actually give equal priority to every thought that's coming into your mind. So like you're, you're closing on the dream home of a lifetime, right? And you got 40 minutes to get the paperwork back to the broker, or you could potentially lose this house for good. And um, you're working on the paperwork and you get a ding on your phone and you're like, oh, it's an Instagram message. And it's your neighbor's cousin's kid uh, fishing in a lake. And you're like, well, I wonder if he catches the fish. And so you start, this is going to have zero impact on your life. And you're just curious. You start looking at that. And then all of a sudden you feel that, well, I don't have 40 minutes left. I got 30 minutes and I don't have 30 minutes. I got 25 minutes. And now that external pressure forces you to drop the phone, hyper-focus on what you're doing. And at 4.59, you get the paperwork back to the broker and you're like, I work well under pressure. Right? You're essentially, from a physiological standpoint, you're saying, I lack the ability to set priorities internally, so I use external priorities to set my, I use external pressure to set my priorities. And this is how most people go through life, because they haven't, they don't have that proper balance of neurotransmitters, either in the supply or the demand, and so now equal weight gets given to every single thought, and they're labeled ADD or ADHD, or their mind is very clouded, right? And the more disorganized we are in the mind, the more we crave organization in our outside environment, which is essentially what OCD is, right? Obsessive compulsive disorder is obsessively trying to control the environment around you because you're so disorganized in the mind. So people whose minds are not cluttered are not bothered by clutter in their outside environment. People that have very active minds 
are bothered very much by clutter in their outside environment. You know, if they're going to study, not only does the desk they're studying on have to be clean, but the room the desk is in has to be clean. They notice that sock against the, you know, the baseboard, and they got to go pick it up and put it in the hamper before they can actually sit back down and work on a project. And this is this is an effort to clean up the outside environment to to save them from the chaos that's going on internally. Because I don't have OCD, that is not one that I can uh, <laughs> comment on in terms of what it feels like internally. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it makes a lot of sense. I don't know the science well enough to know whether yeah. I agree, or disagree. It certainly has internal logic. It makes a lot of sense. Um, if all of your if you're having trouble distinguishing between the prioritization of a given thought, mm -hmm. um, I think my gut instinct is people will find even if they solve for that problem, kind of like anxiety. Solving the diet problem stopped it from being generalized, mm -hmm. but didn't stop it when there really was something that was high stakes. But I felt like my anxiety has now spilled over into an unusable format. Right. And so even if I were to 100% solve the, um, the, the physiological component of this, there still is going to be a certain amount of just mental well, I don't think we ever want to just not be able to feel anxiety. Right. I think what we, we want to be able to do is feel anxiety in situations where we should feel anxiety. I mean, if you're claustrophobic and you step on a crowded elevator or if you're you're afraid of heights and you walk to the edge of a 30th floor balcony, those are completely different scenarios than us having a conversation like we are right now and me starting to become mm -hmm. consumed with anxiety to the point where you're now speaking to a facade because internally I'm trying to manage my my feeling of anxiousness and anxiety. And this is where a lot of people lie, right? They don't fake anxiety, they fake being okay. Right? Like most people don't fake depression, they fake being okay. 